Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romaine Boston, Caroline High, Taylor Riggs counting you down to the closing bell. Here to help take us beyond the bell, our global simulcast with Carol Masser and Tim Stenevich. Welcome to our audiences across Bloomberg Television and Radio, as well as on YouTube. Carol, taking a look at the S&P right now, it's at 36.13. I just want to point out, at one point on the day, it got down to 35.88. That's about mm -hmm. four points or so away uh, from that 52-week intraday low. You know, I was exactly kind of where I was going to go because I saw it when it was at like, was it 35.85? I feel like, and it was testing the September 30th low and bouncing off of it. Our Gina Martin Adams saying that was kind of significant to see that it tested that and then bounced off, and it feels like that's that's the tone getting so close to some of those lows, but kind of working its way back off of it. Too. And at the high, it was at 36.52, so we saw quite the range today, up more than three tenths of one percent, but at its lows, down more than 1.4 percent, so significant range. And I think that speaks to the volatility that's starting to pick up in the equity markets. There's lagged, of course, when you're looking at the volatility that you usually have in a bond market that's shut today, or indeed the FX. But the fact that the VIX managed to peak almost basically at 34, we're inching closer to some of those levels that people will start to say, OK, is this capitulation level? Yeah, we had a great interview with Scott Bauer of our Prosper Trading Academy, who's done some great research into, well, the VIX, but really then the backwardation, the inverted VIX curve, and really expecting more short-term volatility, maybe some calmness on the horizon. But, Romain, it really is the volatility this week, I think, that the markets are focused on. Yeah, and this could be sort of one of those weeks where we get a big reset to the upside, or maybe uh, the downturn persists here. We should point out that some of the big names, like the Apples and Netflixes uh, of the world, are higher here on the day, as are the Walmarts uh, and the Mercs, but then of course you have the chip makers uh, really kind of deep in the hole here on the day and a lot of the software names as well. You add it up and you get an S&P 500 that's going to finish the day down by almost eight tenths of a percent, down roughly by 28 points, right around that 36.12 level. The Dow Jones Industrial Average down about 94 points or three tenths of a percent, while the Nasdaq Composite is going to fall 110 points or one percent here on the day. The Russell 2000, that's only down about six tenths of a percent and we should point out the Dow Transports managed to finish the day in the green, believe it or not, yeah. higher by five tenths of a percent. Yeah, pretty interesting. Interesting. Uh, we talked about this earlier in terms of one group that was really battered uh, today. We're talking about those semiconductor names down about three and a half percent. If you look at the uh, socks in today's trade, and this has to do with more re uh, regulations and oversight, if you will, uh, coming to from the United States to uh, China's tech industry. And so that really battered a lot of those semi names. Yeah, Carol, you really saw a tilt to the downside when you think, think about some of the individual sectors as well. For the radio audience, we're taking a look at the sectors within the S&P 500. The best performers still have some red in them. For now, it's a lot of the food and beverage, the food and staples, even some of the materials that were up about maybe one half of 1%. But then all of the tech hardware that Carol was just mentioning, a lot of the chip makers, if we go down to the bottom, I mean, semiconductors were off about 3.5%. Some of the software, software can services, hardware equipment as well, off about 1%. So you are really getting sort of that big tech sell off here today too. All right, check it out in terms of some of the gainers, because there were a few of them. And this was top in the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100. We're talking about Walgreens Boots Alliance. That stock up more than 4% in today's session, bouncing off of a 10-year low. Shares of the company, they did hit that 10-year low on Friday. Uh, that's after Mizuhu Securities called uh, the company arguably the most debatable stock in our coverage universe as it faces competitive inflationary and macroeconomic pressures. That was Friday. Got to bounce back today. Keep in mind we have earnings. They're due out on Thursday. All right, Moderna also top in the S&P 500, the NASDAQ 100. I couldn't find any real catalyst, albeit uh, we did see social media volume on the stock surging today, so there was a lot of conversations happening, certainly out in the world of social media. We get earnings in about a month, early November. And then I thought this was interesting. Boeing up 1.6% off its highs of the day. It was up more than 4.5% at one point. This is after a report noted that the first commercial 737 MAX flight appeared to have resumed flying into China for the first time in almost four years. So a pretty big uh, movement when it comes to uh, Boeing shares and certainly significant development, Tim. Yeah, such a huge market for Boeing. Yep. Uh, let's talk uh, some of these software companies that moved lower today. Romaine, you mentioned 
mentioned uh, Snowflake earlier, and you talked about software companies moving lower. Microsoft, so it's not just the uh, non the unprofitable companies, the ones that don't actually have earnings. A company like Microsoft down more than 2% today, um, really weighing on the S&P 500, weighing on the NASDAQ 100 on a points basis, the worst performer in both of those indices. Uh, NVIDIA shares falling 3.4%. Chip companies falling today. We've talked about the new U.S. curbs on China's access to American tech. 52-week low for NVIDIA at its lowest level today. It was actually trading at levels last seen since August of 2020. The stock's closing at its lowest level since November of 2020 as well. And then Rivian finishing the day out down by more than 7.2% after the EV maker said it's recalling almost all of the vehicles delivered to its customers after discovering a minor, minor structural defect. The company did say they only found this on seven uh, seven of the vehicles, uh, but the CEO did say that a fastener, quote, may not have been sufficiently torqued, and it is recalling all of those vehicles. Pretty dour day for Rivian, pretty dour day cross-asset, really. The only bright spot, once again, on the day, on the year, is the U.S. dollar, which is pushing higher. We had a risk-averse sort of a day. Geopolitics loom large, Russia, Ukraine, the tensions reamplifying there. And, of course, not to mention some concern between trade of U.S. and China. We see, therefore, the dollar go higher. And, and indeed, it means we've got weakening across the board. The Aussie dollar off by 1.2% as commodities roll over. We see also the Kiwi weakening by 8 tenths percent and some of the European. The pound under a lot of pressure, even as the Bank of England has stepped in to try and support its own bond market. The market testing some of that resolve. We're looking at commodities that are down across the board. After the run-up that we've seen in oil, it was notable that Brent crude was off by more than 2%. So too was WTI in the face of perhaps some of these geopolitical tensions. And really across the board, we saw metals roll over. And sovereign bonds. We know that the US was closed, but we see European yields push higher. Austrian 30 are up by 20 basis points. Germany, the 30 are up by 17 basis points. 18, remember that big deal being struck that Germany at last might capitulate, might sell debt together with the rest of the EU, support that move, enable to shore up some of the rest of the EU when it comes to these energy price rises. But these aren't grants, these are loans. Taylor. I feel so lost without my normal yields chart here, but we'll just sort of use this time to kick off again sort of the market's uh, reaction and really sort of the big economic data that we're expecting. Carol, for me, as I know it is for you, a big CPI report. It was interesting, though, I was reading some information from Omer Sharif. You know him over at Inflation Insights, and he cautioned a little bit that the core inflation month over month, it could decelerate, which is a good thing, to just about three-tenths of one percent. But the last time that happened, it then re-accelerated after. After that. So there's definitely going to be a lot of nuances within this data. Yeah, absolutely. It's September data, but nonetheless, it'll be something we'll be thinking about because it's a key or what last inflation, right? We're getting down to, you know, thinking about the next Fed meeting and what they're going to have to analyze. I want to go back to, and I can't believe I missed it, the NASDAQ Golden Dragon, which was down a lot in today's session. Yeah. Um, I know, I know. I think you talked about it earlier, right, in terms of the gambling. Um, but it does make me think about, you know, week travel coming off of the holiday there, the Golden Week holiday, COVID flare-ups. I mean, when this economy continues to struggle, you do think about what's the global impact on everybody else. We're seeing that global impact right now with the chip sector because China is such an important customer for so many chip companies. Having the U.S. come out and say, you know, you're not allowed to sell certain types of chips, certain types of technology to this entire country has significantly concerned the analysts who cover the space. This shouldn't have, though, have been a complete surprise. I mean, I no. understand the knee-jerk reaction, but we've been moving in this direction now uh, for months, and you could probably make an argument that we've been moving in this direction for years. But it's another layer, right, on the semiconductor stocks that are already pace, you know, facing problems, whether it's lower PC demand and lower demand within. We've heard some of the warnings already from companies, and then you layer this on top of it, right, in terms of geopolitical and concerns. You it, do wonder what how it plays out in terms of their earnings. It did seem to catch a lot forward. of investors off guard, though, right? I mean, if they expected it, we wouldn't have seen shares fall this much Or is it just result. another excuse to sell? Is there just a reason that people don't want to be long these markets at the moment? When you've got geopolitics rising its ugly head again, when you You've got what is going to be a week of IMF, World Bank, dour talk about recession, about a $4 trillion impact that you have in lost growth out to 2026 because of what is the global central bank movement to fight inflation. And it is global. I think that's such a key theme. I think sort of the big picture topics we've all been discussing is the global coordination or maybe the global conundrum that central banks find them in this time yeah. and are we all hiking and is this sort of a global coordinated uh, cycle that's underway but we're not all right we yeah. saw australia back off a little bit you don't necessarily see china you know that's 
as we start to see maybe some central banks start to do it a little bit differently, how does that provide opportunities for investors? Well, I mean, I think the coordination is kind of starting to come to an end, or at least it's, it's certainly cracking. And you think uh, about a lot of countries out there that are actually uh, seeing the negative effects of that rate hiking, particularly uh, coming out of the U.S., and they have to sort of move in a different direction if they want to protect their uh, own currency and, more importantly, their own economy. And Tim Carroll, I'd be interested to hear how many conversations you're having where investors and people with money to manage are talking about the Federal Reserve being forced to break something. We've talked all day about the liquidity issue that we've got in the U.S. Treasury market at the moment, the withdrawal. We had Lael Bryanard, of course, of the Federal Reserve talking to that. Is this going to be the next key conundrum as we see the bond markets reopen tomorrow? It's a really good point. We just had um, the chief investment officer over at ACM Funds. He's got like 50 to 60 percent of his funds in cash because he finds that's the best opportunity right now. Um, so that was very bearish for us to Same. certainly hear, right? So it's just like <laughs> people backing off at this point. Um, that's a wrap. Remains just in gold coins and cash. Is he? Yeah, but don't, <laughs> don't let anyone know. You know, I went over to Jersey this weekend, Carol. I missed you. Uh, well, why didn't you stop in? <laughs> no, I don't know. Yeah, I don't like to pop, just pop in, you know. But you could have stopped by, had a drink with us or something. <laughs> Next time around, give me a warning. <laughs> and I'll be sure to lock the door. No, just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> hard, 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 hard. Cool. All right, guys. That's a wrap. We'll be back same time, same oh, place. Our cross-platform coverage. Maybe Romaine or I won't be here. Who knows? <laughs> uh, Beyond the Bell. We'll see you on Tuesday.